Thank you. But I, I love this one. All right. And I, Ladies and gentlemen, thank you said. very much for coming out here this snowy day. It looks like you didn't let yes, that no, stop you. I'm really pleased. Um, we're really pleased here to be having this afternoon Sam Law, uh, one of our numerous excellent local historians and storytellers, and she's going to give us some some little-known insight into some characters yeah. from Levita's past, and we're all looking really forward to that. Mm -hmm. uh, before we begin, I'd just like everybody to uh, say thank you to Peggy for providing the cookies today. So thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. And Mitzi, Mitzi will return um, as well, but um, in the meantime, we're being well looked after by Peggy. Uh, I also want to just say a couple of plugs for some library things, is that next Friday, the 24th, uh, if you're into music trivia, we've got a music trivia night down at Mount Mervyn, 7 p.m. Friday, February 24th. Um, it's going to be music trivia bingo, which is going to be an interesting combination. So you've got to know your music, and you've also got to be lucky, so you've got to have those two skills. Um, so those are, that's a, a library event that's coming up. Um, if you have any suggestions for movie matinees that the library might be able to show, we're putting some together, but if you have any suggestions for movies, uh, do please let us know. And if you have any other suggestions for programs, or if you yourself would like to do a program sometime, um, do please let us know as well. We're always open for that. And also starting, um, starting up, in fact, you can ask for a copy downstairs at the desk. We're doing our Two Peaks, One Book again, which is sort of our Whoa. winter reading program. And it's A Man Called Ovi, um, is the book that we're going to read. A, a movie adaptation of it just came out with Tom Hanks. So we're going to do the book, and copies of the book are available for free downstairs at the desk. Kind of first come, first serve. And we'll have a series of, of two or three programs associated with it, but that's going to happen sometime in March, once Mitzi's back on her feet a little bit more. Uh, we'll be doing that, but if you want to get started reading it, you can certainly do that as well. Um, so those are the library plugs. We are so delighted, like I said, here to have Sam come present this. Um, and I'm just really looking forward to what she's going to say and how she's going to say it. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, thank you. What we're gonna get. Um, but uh, anyway, that book that we're going to be reading is great. What's so sad is Mitzi and I have been talking about this talk for at least a year and a half. And that we should find the one week she can't be here, and then last week to have pulled our first snowstorm. Are we complaining? No. No. Um, anyway, today we got that beautiful Colorado day, so we're, we're all, uh, all ready, ready to go. Um, so anyway, I am, uh, I think I know most of you. I'm Sam Law. I'm so glad that you've come here today to either meet or in maybe a few cases re-meet um, some of the, uh, two of the forgotten founders of, of La Vida, uh, who, just not to keep you in suspense, <laughs> are uh, William Jackson Palmer on the left, uh, who was born um, in 1836, Hiram Vasquez, who was born in 1843. So they're seven years apart, with Palmer being the older of the two. Uh, Jackson died at age 72 in 1909. Uh, Hiram died at age 96 in 1939. So uh, they were born seven years apart, died 30 years apart. Um, and uh, my sister's always said, so, she's always said, well, how old are they? Forget the dates. Anyway, so if I say that, um, uh, Hiram was four, then you'd know somewhere out there in the United States, uh, Palmer was 11. <laughs> okay, seven years to So if I say Palmer was 24, then we know that somewhere Hiram is out here at age 17. So they're always seven, seven, years, uh, seven years apart. Um, now, uh, Hiram Vasquez, I'll just tell you, did not start off life as a Vasquez. He was christened Hiram Washington Ashcroft, a name that comes from uh, Norfolk, England, shows up about the 1200s, and uh, meant people who lived near the ash. Um, and, but interestingly enough, this is what I found interesting, is that Palmer is also a name from the 1200s from Norfolk, England. So um, I found it uh, uh, strangely cool that these two men, uh, from similar stock, both non-natives of Colorado, 
They both chose Colorado to be their home and, uh, and to each make unique contributions in founding this little town that we, that we live in. Um, and how Hiram becomes a Baskist hopefully will become understandable. So my goal today is um, to have you, I hope, leave as impressed with these two, uh, these two men as I am, and that maybe you will be equally supportive of uh, seeing their historical profiles kind of elevated um, in our town. But I say I'm a, an amateur because, one, I have absolutely no intention of hiding my prejudices at all. <laughs> uh, not very professional. And the other thing that I'll tell you is that I haven't done a lick of uh, primary resource research myself. Everything that I know about these two men, I know through other people. Um, so they're wrong, I'm wrong. But I also have the most, uh, uh, highest confidence in the integrity of the sources that I have used. The first and foremost being this work, um, Hiram Vasquez, One Man's Family, by Zella Ray Albright. Um, I don't know when uh, Zella died, um, but uh, she, uh, her son was in Vietnam. She needed a project. Her next door neighbor or a friend of hers was this gal, Maud, who was Hiram's last living child. She died in uh, Walsenburg in uh, uh, 1976. Anyway, she was hearing all these stories, and she said, that's my project. I am going to write this all up. The research she did, the clarity of her work, the fun things she adds, I just, it's really one of the, uh, one of the most um, enjoyable, enjoyable books. And then the other uh, source is from our true historian, from a local historian, uh, Nancy Christopherson, who's been writing and documenting the town, its denizens, for, for years to come. You can see how dog eared my copy of her, um, of her book is. And um, she also, <laughs> a while back, wrote a, a series on Hiram Vasquez that appeared in the paper, which she ends by saying, the Vasquez name has mostly disappeared from the historical record of Warfano County, but it shouldn't have. Here ye, period. Um, so I've also collected my own little uh, library, Palmer Library, from the Glen Erie Collection, the Pioneer Museum, in all the there's different Palmer societies, uh, societies around, and I would be happy to recommend any that anyone wants to do. And then the other thing I wanted to add, uh, thank um, Clyde Schroeder. I don't know how many of you ever saw his series on, uh, of maps on Levita. They're, they're just uh, really, really wonderful. So, but before we begin, I want to address two, two word things, um, confusions. And the first having to do with the name of our town, um, which, if you look at the historical marker that just sits right outside the library here, um, I always looked at it and I always thought it was about the history of Levita. Um, but if you look close, this is what it says at the top. And that is because Spanish Peaks was the name of this fledgling community for most of its early existence. Uh, it was the name on the post office when uh, it first, the first post office opened here in um, 1871. And so it was always known as Spanish Peaks until the railroad arrived and with it came the name Movida. Uh, so the other, um, the other thing is I want to talk about forgotten. These, these founders aren't forgotten. A better word would have been underrepresented, but try doing that on a poster. You know? uh, and uh, anyway, so um, they are, they're known, but they're, uh, what happens is, this is very, very typical. This is the history of Levita taken from, um, the, uh, from Wikipedia. And uh, as you'll see, um, well, other than my little glitch here, but uh, Colonel John Francisco usually gets the biggest play. Uh, Henry Dager gets always second fiddle, sort of to him. But then uh, Hiram Vasquez only shows up as an unnamed volunteer who uh, 
takes a ride to Fort uh, Lyon, and Palmer shows up nowhere at all, other than euphemistically as the uh, Denver and Rio Grande Railroad. So their names just simply uh, don't appear. Um, but so it's my hope that we will be able to uh, get Reed's phone number. <laughs> <laughs> But it's my hope that we'll be able to, um, as a result of today, uh, change this lineup of our founders to something that looks more like, more like this. Um, and uh, because Francisco for sure started it, but as that old saying was goes, that's only the beginning of the of the story. Um, so because there is so much to say about these two men. What I've done is I've gone through and picked three periods of their lives, uh, boyhood, um, heyday, and, and later years, and then picked some, a few illustrative stories about their life from each of those, each of those uh, um, periods. What I'm aiming to do is to end by 3.30. I like to end by the time. I have no idea we might be here until 7. Uh, I will be speaking to myself by then, I'm quite sure. Um, but. Uh, um, I'd like to, I'm aiming for that, and if you have any clarifying questions as we go along, please ask them. I hate leaving people in the dark. If you have a more in-depth question, I'll stay after we're done, and we can have a question and answer session if, if, uh, if anybody is, is up for that. Um, okay, by way of introduction, let me just say that I think these two men really do represent the Alpha and Omega of energies behind uh, the existence of La Vida. One of them, um, Palmer, was the grandest of grand visionaries, uh, whereas Hiram Vasquez was the one who had the hands-on know-how to make that dream come true. And um, without both of them, La Vida might have been just another Garland City. Uh, how many of you know of Garland City? No? Well, Garland City was the next railroad town just to our west, about 20 miles west of here. Um, and besides having the railroad tracks uh, going through it, as you can see it had, um, it had uh, eateries, saloons, boarding houses, stables, blacksmiths, uh, dry goods stores, and a jail. Um, and this is uh, Garland City today. Um, so in order for a town to not suffer that same fate. It had to have a lot of different kinds of energies and people playing very, very important things. And that's what Will Palmer and Hiram Vestas uh, bequeathed, bequeathed to us. And uh, though the two men really could not have been more different, one of the things that struck me the most about them were that they were almost identical twins in character. Uh, I mean, they're there are just so many similarities. Both were extraordinarily optimistic. They were exuberant lovers of, of life. They were both very smart, very well read, and not highly educated. Um, uh, they were um, curious, honest, very, very hard working, and above all else, known for both their integrity and their bravery. Um, so I can only assume that if they ever got to meet one another, they would have really enjoyed each other's, each other's company. Okay, so let's begin with the boyhood of uh, Hiram Vasquez, who um, in 1847, um, when he was four years old, he moved to Fort Bridger in southwest corner of Wyoming uh, with his mother and with her new husband the renowned frontiersman Louis Vasquez, uh, an aristocrat who went around literally trading with Indians in a coach and four. I like this guy. You know, uh, it must have, been, must have been something to see him coming over a, coming over a rise. Um, and on this particular day, uh, in this four-year-old's life, he was having a bad day. He was fighting with his friends. He was bored. He was feeling cooped up, and when he saw that the door to the, um, the, the big gate to the fort was open, he, he made a, a run for it, grabbing his sister as he went so that they could go outside and play tag. 
Um, after a little while, they began to remember just how bad the spanking was going to be that they were going to get for playing outside. So they started heading back to the fort when, out of nowhere, an Indian brave came whooshing by, grabbed up Hiram, put him on the front of, in front of him, and just took off for the horizon. Um, they rode and rode and rode and rode until finally um, Hiram was deposited in front of this seated uh, Indian who um, was mesmerized by this, by this boy. He got up, he started fingering his white blonde hair. Um, he uh, pushed up his sleeves to look at his milky skin. And then he put his face about two inches from the boys. Hiram Vasquez had the most blue, piercing, clear eyes anybody ever saw. And um, so he must have pleased this man who was Chief uh, Wasuki from the Shoshone Nation. And uh, because some food was ordered, a bear rug or a buffalo rug was brought for the boy, who, being a young kid, lay down and fell asleep. You know, what else are you, what else are you going to do? Um, and uh, the next day, when he got up, Hiram was immediately just pulled into play with all of these kids who got to run around free, uh, throw lances, throw rocks, uh, hang from bushes and trees and stuff like that, that uh, by the end of the day, he almost completely forgotten to think about his parents and his sister. His sister did make it back into the fort um, again. Another whole story about her, but we won't. But we won't go. How old was he? He was four. Four, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so he soon just settled into being an accepted member of the chief's lodging uh, privilege, which he was wise enough not to flaunt. Um, but he, along with the other cohort of uh, boys his age, was soon being taught by the elders to. Uh, to ride, to track, to skin, to hunt, to, to do everything a Shoshone boy, a boy would. And uh, his native father, uh, Washaki, was particularly pleased when he saw how quickly Hiram picked up learning all of the twirls and cries and dances of the Shoshone native, native, um, native <coughs> dancers. And so, for four years, that's where Hiram lived. He lived this carefree, happy Shoshone boy's life. Uh, meanwhile, he grew exceptionally tall, and uh, and he also had one one little luxury no one else had, and that's that all of the women in his lodge would vie to dress his hair, his long white blonde waist length hair. So they pull it back into at the nape of his neck, and they put a big silver disc uh, it, through a silver disc, and then they braid it and they put in a next size down disc. And they keep doing this. And when his own hair ran out, they'd leave in uh, horse hair that was the same color until eventually he had this braid going all the way down to his heels. And though there were, of course, no mirrors, he knew all his life. He remembered the look of admiration that the men and women, old and young, of his tribe would have when they would look at that, look at that braid. Sam, um, where were the Shoshones at that point in time? Were they there? I had a map on it and I didn't include, but they, if you go from southern Wyoming all throughout that Utah, northern Colorado, all, all right up in, that, up in that area. And the Shoshone and the Arapaho, you know, were really considered like the aristocracy of the Native Americans in, in that area. I'm sure there's many tribes that would dispute that, but um, uh, that, that's, where they, that's where they were. Um, so the only thing that Hiram, that distinguished him from any of the other, the one thing I don't have and I've never heard is what his Indian name was. And I, I can only imagine it would have been, it would have been wonderful. Um, the only way in which he was treated differently from anyone else was that he was never allowed to join a trading party. And he was never given any explanation of why not. It was just uh, his, his uh, native father was adamant about it. But more and more, he began to wonder, what, you know, what is the magic? 
where we take moccasins and hides and we get back beads and knives and sugar and you know all of these wonderful things. So one day was the yeah. just on that list point about not taking one trading party, the trading would be with white people, right? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Well they saw about the mentors with blue eyes and blonde hair. Would they question whether he'd been snatched out? Do you think maybe that's why Wachowski wouldn't ever let him go? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, uh, he'd be for, uh, but you know, Hiram, he knows when he swims that his stomach is white and there's his brow. But he has no idea about his eyes. He, he knows the women love the blonde hair, but he's not really ever totally understanding that he looks different. Um, and anyway, one day he, he um, saw smoke in the far, far distance, and he could tell that a trading party was being, being ready. So he went again to, um, to Ushaki and asked him if he could go, and he got the clear hand, hand down signal, meaning no. And so Hiram, without any, any reaction, left, walked out, got a pony, one of his ponies, and let it down the, the trail and put it in a hiding place. And that night, he stole out of the camp and headed in the direction that he saw the smoke coming from. Um, and so he, he rode and he rode and he rode. And he eventually started seeing these strange, these strange uh, structures that he just didn't understand. They, might, they scared him a bit. So he decided he would just curl up next to a fence in his rug and fell asleep. The next morning, he was awakened to this really strange sound of women talking. And when he looked up and saw him, he could see that they were wearing very bizarre clothes from his point of view. And they were doing something he absolutely didn't understand, pulling on their animals underneath them, you know, and all, obviously they were milking, but he had never, he had never seen it. So, uh, but since they didn't seem to react very negatively to his presence, he started wandering around looking at their, um, that there, uh, you know, these places where he lived, and in one place he could see through the door and he saw a man eating, and so he went and stuck his head in. And the man was surprised, um, and but he, the young boy walked in. He could see him move his uh, his uh, robe, and with that he saw his arm, his white arm, and then he looked closer, and of course he could see the blue eyes and the blonde hair, and he realized he's looking at a stolen, at a stolen boy. Um, so to keep, keep him busy, he pushed some food towards him, which uh, always works with a, a young boy. And um, uh, meanwhile, sent one of the kids who were beginning to gather at the door to get someone. And in fact, the person gotten was a Mormon bishop uh, who came and he brought with him a trapper. Uh, that was uh, in the in the area, and uh, and through sign language, the trapper was able to say, "This is a Shoshone, a Shoshone boy." Um, well, meanwhile, word went out, and people started coming, and so the buzz was, "Who lost a child that might have been this boy's age?" And um, all these names were going around. The trapper was watching Hiram, and uh, when the name Vasquez would come by. Someone said, oh, I think old Louis Vasquez at a Fort uh, Bridger lost a boy, um, you know, some years back. And, uh, and the trapper could see that that name got a, re a response. And pretty soon he pulled him aside, worked with him a little more, and eventually Hiram said, Vasquez, me, Vasquez. And uh, so with that, they knew that they had uh, found what he, he, uh, who he was. Right then, word came that a, uh, an Indian party was approaching, who were looking to trade, and so with that, everything, uh, Hiram was whisked away. Uh, the trader explained to him that he would be putting on different clothes, but that was fine with Hiram because he didn't want to be found quite yet. Uh, but when the, um, when the bishop came over and began to take a hold of his braid and pull out his knife, all hell broke loose. I mean, I just went into, you know, signing as fast as he could that no one touches my brain, 
You crazy looking men may have short hair, but in the Shoshone village, only the women have short hair, not the braves. I'm a brave. Don't touch it. Well, while this was all going on, the trapper went over to the sink and picked up a uh, dipper of water and came back and splashed it in Hiram's face. And it instantaneously had the reaction that he thought it, had, it would have. Getting water splashed in the face is the most common way of reprimanding an Indian child. Mm -hmm. And they don't like it, and it usually stops their behavior. Well, Hiram, with this, feels so embarrassed to be seen like a baby. And so with that, he walks over to the trapper, he turns around, and he has his braid cut off. Um, he's then next taken into this room. There's water coming out of a pipe. It's warm. He can't believe it. There's a big tub. He's put in. He is scrubbed to a fairly well. Uh, then handed some clothes, none of which fit, but uh, they're all scratchy and stuff like that. But there is a pair of black boots with red tops. And oh, he loves them. But of course, he can't walk in them. And the, uh, the trapper sees this and signs, keep your moccasins for, for, oh, for a while. Um, and when Hiram returns to the, uh, to the bishop's cabin, there everybody is just aghast. They cannot believe the transformation of this young Indian boy now into uh, what looks like a, a, young, a young white step settler. But even though he was so transformed, it was decided he still should stay inside until it was really clear that the Shoshone tribe was gone, the traders. And so he was there, and he didn't mind it at all. He was mesmerized to watch the women churning butter and rolling dough and sifting flour and uh, you know grinding meal. He, he just was fascinated by that. But soon enough, the trapper came back, leading two pen ponies. Off they went, they rode for three days, stopping just to water their horses, to occasionally uh, eat some, uh, eat some hardtack uh, and take a little sleep. And, but after three days, they, on the fourth day, they came over a rise, and there in the distance was Fort Bridger, um, with the trapper now beginning to sign to, to Hiram, uh, mother, father. And so he begins to understand. This is, this is where he's going. Once the trapper has been identified from a long ways away, the, the gate to the, to the fort is open, and uh, everybody starts bustling around to see who the newcomers are. Uh, and in the crowd is one woman who almost faints. I mean, I just always, who almost faints away because here is the son she's been mourning for four years. Um, and so she, when she gets back up, she, she rushes to him to hold him, you know, hug this tall, I mean, he's really tall for his age, um, uh, young man, and that just scares, uh, scares him. I mean, he just jumps back in fright, and, you know, and so the, uh, the, the trapper um, says that, uh, he, he says, listen, beg pardon, ma'am, but you oughtn't crowd that poor critter. He done forget his own lingo, except in his name, in all his ways, but he's smart, he'll come around, give him time, ma'am, give him time, he'll come around. And so, everybody had eight? eight? He's uh, nine. Nine? Yeah. And, uh, and so, everybody realized it wouldn't be instantaneous, but the family was very, very loving. He had these other siblings by this time, and... Um, and in fact, he did, he did <coughs> work his way back into the family. <coughs> they all moved to Salt Lake City for three years, where he began to get some schooling from uh, uh, um, Brigham Young's brother. But after a while, his, uh, his father said, uh, his father was very educated, he said, it's time for the family to move back to St. Louis so that my son now can really uh, take up his education in earnest. However, during that time between his return to the family and their departure for Salt for uh, St. Louis, uh, every once in a while, word would come that Shoshaki was in the in the area, and he would make it known that he would really uh, so welcome a visit from Hiram, and uh, Louis always said yes, knowing that Hiram really loved his his uh, native father. In fact, he loved him 
dearly for his for his um, his whole life. And uh, well, once they got back, oh, so anyway, he would go he would go see him, and uh, he made even a couple of trips during his life to to see him. But once they got back to uh, St. Louis, the thing that surprised them the most was the rank that seemed to be brewing between the North and the South over the issue of slavery. Um, now his mother, having come from Kentucky, uh, she had two house slaves um, who were helping raise her ever-growing ever -growing family, uh, both of whom loved Hiram. Hiram loved them. Uh, but he did remember that as well as he was treated and loved with the Shoshone, he always bristled at the fact that he was not as free as any of the rest of them to come and go as he pleased. And so he thought, that has to be the same way with slaves, you know. And so he began to side with the North um, and seeing, seeing their position. Uh, but he, he never felt like he was part of the coming fight because, in fact, he felt like a foreigner. What year is this? About? This is around uh, 55, 56, okay. somewhere in there, 57. Um, Dred Scott had just happened. I mean, things were really kind of blowing up. But he thought, I'm in this foreign country, and they're just going to have to sort this issue out amongst, them, amongst themselves, because my home is the West. My home is where there are forts and Indians and, and my chief and, and all. Um, so he... Uh, he, he didn't see that that was what was uh, in, his, in his future. Uh, but he also knew he just had to get back out west. Um, he, as much as he was trying to please his very erudite father um, with his uh, learning, Hiram, for Hiram to go and sit in a school inside all day, in a row, in shoes, in a uniform, uh, stand up, sit down, whenever somebody told you, it, it amounted to really near torture for him. And, uh, and he knew he would never be able to last very long, and he knew a regimental life would absolutely kill him. He wouldn't mind the bullets. It would be the, the life in, inside. Um, so his father luckily understood this in his son and had started asking around about uh, jobs that his son might do to get him back out west and also to get him away from <coughs> the... Uh, looming war, and in asking around, he found out that a man named Saran St. Rain, who Louis had known years before in the trade, fur trading business, um, was had commissioned a wagon train. It was going to be leaving St. Louis in three days. It was going to go due west and then south to, uh, south to, to uh, Colorado. And uh, so Louis went and found the, um, the uh, wagon master, asked him if... Um, he could use a six foot two uh, strapping young man who knew away his way around wagon trains, and the, the answer was yes. I need two of them for water boys, and so in three days' time, um, they were. He and his best friend Felix Bridger uh, were what Hiram would view as heading home, and. The, uh, the job of a water boy, just to tell you, is to, uh, to keep the water barrel that's attached to the grub wagon full at all times. So for 43 days straight, every time they came anywhere near any water source, their job was to run, fill up these big heavy buckets with water, run back, pour them, get them, pour them into the barrel, and then go back and do it again. And it didn't matter if you were heat, mosquitoes, lightning, no matter what, you had to do this. And um, to Hiram's uh, way of thinking, it was about as sweet as life as he could possibly imagine. He was out, he was under the stars, he was around oxen and mountain men, and uh, he was moving. And to him, that was about the most ideal life he could, he could think of. The only thing he detested was the, the uh, trail boss. Um, who was a mean, high-strung man who was very quick with this loathsome, loathsome black uh, whip uh, that he would just use whenever he could find anybody who'd done anything uh, that he felt wasn't, wasn't, quite, wasn't quite right. So whenever he was around, everything was tense, even among the water boys. Um, and people tried to stay out of his way, but one day, um, 
when they were passing a military train, a military uh, wagon train, the cattle from the two got mixed up. And Dobson, that was the name of the trail, he lost it. And he just went after the first drover he could find. He opened up his scalp with the flick of his, flick of his whip and, uh, and was coming in uh, for more when the next whip flash never came because Hiram just ran in as hard as he could into the man, grabbed him by the waist, took him down, yanked the whip out of his hands and threw it away into the sagebrush. Well, you can imagine, this guy jumps up ready to break Hiram in two, and he looks around at all of the eyes of the men watching him and realizes maybe he'll need to save that for a later day. <laughs> He realizes he'd probably lose his life if he if he went after Hiram. Um, so he goes on. He jumps on his mule. He yanks its head around and just screams at everybody, "Get our cattle back now!" And he and he rides off. And so Hiram goes right back. He never gives any sign of gloating. He just goes back. He he greases wheels in in the time, uh, but he does get his gun, and he starts carrying it with him everywhere he goes. Because he knows, in a fight, Dobson is so big and burly, he would have about the chance of a cricket, you know, to come out of a, a fight like that. Um, but he thinks, well, maybe this isn't going to be necessary until they get to their last water crossing, and uh, Dobson notices that a water barrel is missing. And with that, he has his excuse. He comes for Hiram. He's just screaming, swearing a blue streak, comes straight for him, you know, flicking his whip. And then he looks and he sees that Hiram is armed. And the gun is pointed straight at Dobson. And he, that stops him in his tracks. And Hiram says to him in a very low, calm voice, you come one step closer to me, Fred Dobson, and I'm going to shoot you in the belly. And he said, now I'm leaving this train today, and I don't want to have to kill you before I go. But if I have to, I will. And he said, so now just get back on your mule, and let's get this wagon across that river, and, uh, and you just move on. And luckily, Dobson was so involved with that activity that Hiram was able to, and his friend Felix, grab up all of their stuff and hit the road. They left the wagon train that day. Strangely enough, Felix, after a little while, begins to feel guilty, not about Dobson, but to leave a wagon train without a water boy. You know, it's just, it's just not OK. Hiram isn't having any of it. Hiram says that he's going to go on to Fort Lyons, where he knows they'll be haying. He wants to earn enough money in order to uh, be able to catch a stagecoach that would be heading south. Um, to where his uh, father's friend, uh, Saran St. Brain is. And in the process, he passes what he believes is the most beautiful place he has ever seen in his, in his life. Um, how are you? He had good taste. Huh? He had good taste. He has good, <laughs> good taste. You are right. Uh, all right, a shift in, a shift in. I have mode. a question. Yeah. All that, was that from an, his own biography, his autobiography, or who wrote those accounts? It was mainly from his daughter Maud, okay, who would would just tell these stories all the. I mean, Hiram was a storyteller like crazy, but no one ever wrote it down until till Zella did, and thank God she did. Uh, I mean, he was a. It's a good uh, one. Uh, so anyway, so so um, young. Uh, Young Will Palmer is, uh, is born um, into a poor but very refined, very devoutly Quaker family who prize education above just about every, everything else. Um, even when it was very hard for, for ends to meet, he would still nevertheless be sent. They moved to Philadelphia. He was born in Maryland, he, uh, Delaware. Uh, they moved to Philadelphia so that he could attend these really, really great schools. Um, and. Uh, he studied, he studied modern languages, natural history, trigonometry, elocution, I mean, engineering, everything. But he, he glummed towards anything that had to do with his first love in life, which was 
steam locomotives. That was what was in his, his, um, his blood. Uh, I, what I love is the motto of this very prestigious high school that he went to. This was their motto. I think it stands uh, in good reason. And uh, to prepare young people for life, both as citizens in a republic and as individual actors in a competitive marketplace. Um, and judging by where uh, Will ended up, I think we could say he got an A+. Plus in the, uh, so his, uh, his first job out of school was as a surveyor. He was out trampling through the hills of western uh, Pennsylvania day and night uh, in all kinds of weather, living on uh, beef jerky and, and coffee, um, and just putting up with every kind of uh, bad weather situation that you could imagine. And he, too, was having the time of his life. He just loved the outdoors, loved animals just love being out there. However, uh, his brightness and his eagerness soon caught the attention of the president of the, he was surveying for the railroad um, when he was doing this job. He, he caught the attention of the president who decided to send this very bright young man over to England um, to, uh, to study what were they doing with railroading and were there any new ideas that he could possibly learn about and bring back uh, to the United States. Um, Will loved this assignment. He was always an excellent writer. While he was gone, he made all of his pocket money by writing articles uh, for magazines about the lectures he was going to, the characters he was meeting, the innovations he saw, all the trips he took. The only thing he didn't write about were the two concepts that stayed with him the most, and that was that they were using coal instead of wood to power their locomotives. And the other was that they were using a three foot wide track in those areas where they needed to get into very, very tight, tight places. Both of those concepts would, uh, would stick with Will and... Um, the three and foot being what we call narrow. Narrow, which. narrow, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> four foot eight is the normal size. Um, Supposedly because that's the size of a Roman chariot, you know, we all know that sort of thing. Anyway, um, but uh, uh, he, he, he came back with those two ideas, and those two ideas would, in fact, be what made him a millionaire. But, not yet, because as much as he loved railroads, Will hated slavery. He thought slavery was America's greatest moral curse, and he was committed to doing anything and everything he could to put an end to it. Uh, being a Quaker who opposed <coughs> war, his first efforts went into raising money for the idea that he thought would work, and who knows it might have, to buy the freedom of every slave at three times their going uh, uh, value. It probably would have saved, well, you know, I mean, we lost, what, 800? You know, anyway, the loss in, in everything. But that was his first effort. And then he also started, became a co-founder of something called the Young Men's Lead in Philadelphia, which was a place where they could invite all of the great uh, abolitionists of the day to come educate people just on the, the horrors of, uh, of slavery. And oftentimes, he would have to fight his way through an armed, very raucous uh, mob, people who were out there protesting these, these, uh, these meetings that he was uh, um, holding. Uh, but eventually, uh, when war finally did come, Will was 24, and he not only enlisted, which got him immediately thrown out of his Quaker meeting, um, when Will went to the uh, union recruiting office, he came with his own cavalry. Wow. He had decided that he would, if he was going to fight, he was going to fight on horseback, and so he just said about it, he went all over Philadelphia, all over Pennsylvania, and recruited a hundred men, who said yes, they would be willing to join a light cavalry with him as captain, and uh, so that's who he showed up at the office, uh, uh, the recruiting office with, and um, as it turned out, that unit was so successful that in a year, uh, Will was ordered to raise it from 100 people to regimental strength 
of uh, 1,800 people, no, 1,200, 1,200 uh, riders, and uh, with him now being their commander as a colonel. So he was given a, a, a promotion. Um, and they had a, a stellar career throughout, throughout the war. However, Will's next major assignment didn't have anything to do with writing. It had to do with the telegraph. Um, and uh, right after the Battle of Antietam, one of the bloodiest battles of the whole war, the Confederates were in retreat. And because Will knew how to do the telegraph, which he had learned from his survey buddy, Andrew Carnegie, who had taught him everything that he needed to know. They asked Will if he would go behind enemy lines to report on Lee's, Lee's maneuvering. Um, he said he would, and he lasted at it two days. He was captured, probably betrayed by somebody that they thought was helping him. Uh, luckily, he was in civilian clothing, which uh, thereby escaped immediate execution um, as a spy, but it didn't keep him from uh, being sent to a horrible, horrible uh, prisoner of war um, prison called uh, Castle Thunder in Richmond, uh, Virginia, uh, where he had to just fight it. He had to fight the rats every day to keep the food to live on, waiting, 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 hoping for a, a prisoner exchange. Um, and, uh, and, and that's the way life was going until one day this group of Confederate officers arrived at the prison among whom was this one absolute bastard who just went around claiming how much he hated and loathed the Yankees. He just couldn't stand them. But when he got over near Will, he managed to convey to Will a message. And it was, you were to take this message and personally deliver it to President Lincoln. So. With that, Will is understanding his release is imminent. The, uh, the message that he got was uh, that um, the South was, were sending their ironclad, the Merrimack, to uh, Hampton Roads, where the Union fleet was uh, anchored. And they were going, it was going to be a surprise attack in order to try and blade, uh, break the blockade. Uh, that the North had on the South, that was just strangling, strangling the South. The message, and so that was the message Will was taking, that's what they're doing. It gave the Union time enough to get their ironclad, the Monitor, uh, down from wherever it was up in New York, and, uh, and so ensued probably the most famous inconsequential battle, uh, a naval battle ever, uh, in that the blockade held, uh, neither side won. However, it did spell the very end of wooden fighting ships. There would be no more of those being made. Everything was going to be uh, iron from, from, then, from then on. Um, so the rest of Will's career is, uh, is of the same ilk. His very, very uh, Quaker mother, said, if you must fight, fight well. Wow. And, uh, and indeed he did. By age 28, Will is made the second youngest uh, brigadier general in the Union Army, uh, having been beaten only by uh, Mr. Custer, who was made uh, one at age 23. Um, he, Will would win the, uh, earn the Medal of Honor, the, the military's highest honor for bravery. Um, and uh, in his last major assignment, he, uh, he, his cavalry was one of the people who were going to try and capture um, Jefferson Davis, the now fleeing ex-president of the Confederate Army. Will did not capture Davis, but Will did capture his wagon train. <laughs> yep, on which there was uh, over uh, $200,000 uh, in gold, and one and a half million dollars in Union currency, uh, good currency. And strangely enough, out of all that he did with his with his cavalry, his regiment, who loved him and they loved, uh, he loved them. The thing that made him the proudest was when that money was returned to the Union authorities. Not a penny of it was missing. All of his men had been picked because of their character. And he insisted on that, and he said, never did it stand better against the, the tests. Uh, and so 
it was the thing he would talk about the most um, in his in his life. Um, so that's how Will spent his youth. Um, and now on to uh, back to the uh, to the heydays. Are we all right? Does anybody need to stand up? We okay? Um, okay. Well, uh, so Hiram Hiram had gotten on that stagecoach as you as you remember, and he had taken it to Mora, this little uh, settlement that was just north of um, north of Santa Fe, where he met Saran Saint Vrain, uh, this old friend of his father, who was delighted to meet uh, Hiram, and uh, he was even happier to hire Hiram when he learned that this good nature, tall kid could do just about anything, and best of all, he didn't drink hmm. at all, just like Palmer didn't drink. Um, and, uh, and then when he heard Hiram picking up this uh, local Spanish dialect with, with such ease, his first big assignment for um, Hiram was that he was going to, he put him in charge of a, a large group of men who were going north with a wagon train that St. Brain was sending up to uh, his partner, uh, John Francisco, at um, Fort, Fort Garland. Now, Francisco um, was, he had partnered with St. Brain in order to open up the Kachara Valley, which was one of five valleys that St. Brain had um, received in a four million acre land grant he was given by the Mexican government in 1844. Uh, so that was the land grant, <coughs> five valleys in it, and the idea was you needed to develop it in order to be able to claim it. And so uh, St. Brain reached out to Francisco to help him develop the, uh, the Cachera the Cachera Valley, just as an aside, all four million of those acres would transfer to uh, U.S. ownership at the end of the war, uh, Mexico, war with Mexico in 1848, and immediately they began to whittle it down until, in the end, uh, Vasquez, uh, Francisco, and uh, another partner would only end up with 4,300 acres, for which they paid $38,000 in 1866. So a far cry from four million, but as we know, even with that 4,300 acres, um, Francisco said it was paradise enough for him, right? Um, and he had already recently picked out a four-acre area in um, on the Gachara River where he wanted to build his first permanent settlement. But because Francisco was so involved with so many other business activities, he then partnered with a man named uh, uh, Henry Dager, um, who was a brilliant, hard-working, hard-driving uh, a man. And it was him that took went with that wagon train that had been sent up to, um, did I say that those workers went with the wagon train that was sent to uh, Francisco? Dagger was the one that brought it over the mountain from Fort Garland and brought it to this area and put everybody to work building what would become the first permanent structure in, in, this, in this area. The and uh, Dagger, the fort. The fort. That, well, they, yeah, they called it the plaza. They called it the, the plaza. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and Dagger, like St. Vrain, quickly realized what a gem he had in Hiram, uh, that he was as skilled as he was agreeable, and uh, he was as strong as he was wiry tall. And so he uh, first put him to felling trees, clearing land, and diverting water from the, um, uh, water from the Kachera River to go into, they built a long pit, about 100 feet long and shallow. And they, the water would run into it, and that's where the, uh, they put oxen to walk back and forth to grind uh, a hay, uh, grass into the mud in order to make um, oh, adobe bricks. Wow. Yeah, yeah. And so Hyman was in charge of that. And then when it was time to build this uh, this plaza, um, Hiram was put in charge of uh, that. He was to make this two foot thick, hundred foot long um, long building 
when it was determined that the, the cattle were needed by all the Union forts in this area, because the war now was on, um, Hiram was picked to be the one who would drive the cattle. He drove over 6,000 of them, um, many to back over to Fort Garland, where he Hiram met uh, um, Kit Carson. They became good friends. He built him a slaughterhouse. When um, it was decided that the plaza needed a grist mill, it was Hiram. Oh, oh where did we go? Did you already see Ellie? No, no, no. Oh, 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 stop, stop, stop. No, no, close your eyes, close your eyes, close your eyes. Don't look. Don't look. Oh, come on. Come on. How did I do that? There we go, grist mill. Okay, anyway, he, he built, he made himself um, these survey tools and he uh, taught himself to survey. And then this, this uh, second high little uh, ditch coming off of the river fed up to the top of a hill that was steep enough to turn the, the grist mill's um, wheel. And uh, that street, that mill was right where those lines intersect. The street beyond it is Cascade Street. Huh. So that's the street you take when you go up to the, uh, to the town of water, because that's where the water was running, and that's what they would use to then turn this mill. So everybody who was beginning to farm around here could come and grind their grain and, and, uh, and sell it where, wherever it was that they, um, that they needed to, to get it. Um, and so on his few days off, Hiram would do what he most delighted in doing. Oh, come on. Um, and that was that he would uh, take his bow and arrow and he would uh, supply wild uh, meat for, for the whole plot. Uh, bear, rabbit, turkey, uh, and occasionally he would go out onto the plains and get a, and get a buffalo. Um, he was just an excellent marksman. And of course then it was uh, Hiram who, when there was an Indian raid, was picked to go get help from the cavalry, to ride to Fort Lyon and bring back the, the cavalry. He was picked because of his riding skills and his tracking skills. Everybody knew he'd have the best chance of evading the, the, uh, the Indians that were on the lookout for him. He made it there and back in three days' time without harming his horse one bit. Uh, by the time he got back, the tribe had gone. Um, much to the absolute delight of the 20 uh, cavalrymen he brought back with him, who now just got to sit around and feast at the, <laughs> the new plaza, um, much, to, much to everybody's, everybody's delight. And um, during this time, Hiram is traveling now all back. I mean, he's running cattle, he's doing this ride for the cavalry, and, all, and he finally is saying, you know what, this is the place I can make the kind of life I want. Um, he didn't want to go back to, out to the wild, wild west. That wouldn't be a place to raise a family. But he also wanted to be as far away as, from the strictures of St. Louis as he, as he could be. Um, and so he said, this is, this is where I will stay. And that decision was quickly made even more positive because his father, uh, Louis, sent him a, a, a work mule that was broke to ride. And that gave this young man a who was a natural born dancer the opportunity to attend every hoedown and <laughs> fandango and I mean this man danced all night solely into his life. He never he never missed a dance. But as you can imagine, he soon enough fell in love with a girl that he wanted to marry, uh, but not before he had a cabin and a spread to bring her home to. So um, he, when hire, when hire, he had a what he thought was a gentleman's agreement to develop 175 acres, five miles uh, um, up the river, down the river, and um, he went at it like the lovesick dog that he was. He cleared it, he built it, he planted it, and by the next spring, he was just ready to go back and get his bride when a marshal showed up and said you are to vacate this land immediately, and no explanation was given. And he just felt so gut-punched and betrayed, he packed up his wagon, left by the next morning, never spoke to another person in, uh, in Spanish Peaks. He just, headed, he just headed out. 
mm -hmm. uh, south under the worst, darkest mood he ever could remember being in, until late in the afternoon he heard a trout jump out of a small little pool. And by sunset, he was sitting by the fire, he'd had a, he cooked up some trout, wild onions, he had coffee in one hand, his pipe in the other, and all of a sudden the tilt of the world began to right itself a little bit, and he said to himself, hey, you know, what's done is done, but with hard work, there is absolutely no reason I can't build everything again. And, uh, um, and that, that's, you know, he was going to find a way to raise his family in this paradise. However, that pattern that you just saw would dog Hiram for all of his, all of his life. First, the pattern of a, a building, um, a business, a homestead, you name it, it would flourish. And then some freak accident would snatch it away. It could be a hail cyclone, uh, um, a cricket invasion where they piled up 10 feet high. I mean, a uh, <coughs> land dispute, he, uh, um, or a, uh, a June freeze, a freak freeze, killed 240, 2,400 of his sheep uh, that had just been sheared uh, standing in their traps. Oh my gosh. Um, he had a thriving, set up finally, a thriving uh, sawmill. The uh, boiler blew, blew the whole thing apart. Um, I mean, time and time, it just, it was a pattern that kept repeating it uh, his, his, uh, his whole life. The second pattern was with the women in his life. He married the love of his, of his life, <coughs> and um, had three of the most blissfully wonderful years he could possibly have had, and then watched her die in her third pregnancy um, and, uh, and buried her somewhere out under the trees. Uh, married another gal. He, 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 not the love of his life, but he respected her. They had a great time. They danced, they sang, and stuff like that. She too died in her third pregnancy and lost. Uh, and then he married uh, Martha, um, who uh, kept a um, kept a good house, hated his children uh, to the point of torturing them, um, couldn't abide any music if it wasn't to him, absolutely looked on with uh, disgust at uh, dances, parades, funny stories, and uh, lived through all seven of her pregnancies and went on to um, torment this man for 63 years. Oh my God. <laughs> I know. Um, anyways, he broke the pattern, but not quite in the right, in the right uh, way. Perhaps though, the hardest, and I mean, this is really amazing, the hardest of all was the pattern that he hired loved children, and he would just dote on these these beautiful little babies that he would bring in, 11 living children uh, he had, uh, only to watch them die of, one after another, of a ruptured appendix, <coughs> typhoid fever, uh, pneumonia, um, uh, a tree falling on them, a box of le leukemia. I mean, it, it just was, it was endless until really only three of his children survived him. Um, Which wife? Huh? Which wife? Three, number no. three. Those children were from which wives? The third one. The third one? The one who had seven children. No problem birthing kids. What was her name? Huh? That was Martha. Martha. Oh. That was Martha. Yeah. Yeah. And he adored all those kids. They adored him. None of them liked their mother. <laughs> you know, um, but, uh, uh, I mean, she... <laughs> anyway, he... he uh, but, nonetheless, after every one of these setbacks, Huh? You're on the wrong side. No, I'm not. Oh, no. This was, this was the last pattern in his life. After every single setback, he would come to believe that through hard work, just unrelenting hard work, he'd be able to put something new together, and he always would regain his optimism and believe tomorrow is going to be a better day. That's why you have smiling face. Mm -hmm. I don't know where in the hell that came from. Uh, and now it's smoking a cigar. If you, if, you, uh, if, you, uh, if you notice it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so um, so that was that was him. 
Palmer's hey heyday. Um, is I have a question. Sure. Was he Catholic? Pardon? Was he Catholic? Iron? Did he have a Christian background? He what was had definitely had a Christian background. He loved, uh, but in, he ended his life as a, a Christian scientist. Oh. And it really helped him get through all of these, all of these uh, incredible setbacks. So he, but I don't think he, I never, I don't know that he was Catholic. Um, he, he might have been. Um, well, um, so, uh, prior to the war, as you kind of understood, Will was being groomed to, to run a railroad um, and uh, by a man who was running, at the time, running the largest railroad in the East, and a man who knew that uh, there was going to be such a burgeoning of new railroads being built after the war, um, and he wanted, to be, he wanted to be a part of it. And he really knew that was going to happen because now, in, in, in uh, 1869, the Transcontinental Railroad was completed. Um, and so, with that, all of those other railroads were just going to mushroom, mushroom west. The project that his, uh, his boss, his mentor picked, was one that actually would end up putting Denver on, on the map. Denver at the time was about a town of 5,000 5, people, smaller than Walsenburg. Um, and it had been bypassed by the uh, by the transcontinental railroad. You can see Cheyenne. You can see Denver, Denver over here. And and one magnet was saying, hey, you know, Denver is too dead to bury uh, without railroads. And the territorial governor said, it's it's a lost it's a lost cause. But what uh, um, Palmer and and these other railroaders realized was if you can see Denver, they needed one spur going north to connect up to the Transcontinental Railroad, and then they needed another spur, since 1870, leading from Kansas City um, into, into Denver. And Palmer was put in charge of building both of those, both of those links, which he did uh, under budget, under time, fastest anybody had ever seen it. The, uh, this one, the one going from Kansas over to Denver, 150 miles in 150 days, um, wow. and uh, yeah, so they they uh, they were they were very happy with that. And by the time he had um, finished those railroads, he knew Colorado was going to be his home. He knew it needed a railroad, and that's when he began to think about those baby railroads back in that he'd seen in, in uh, England uh, that could go into narrow narrow little places and. Um, because he knew that the wide ones that he had just laid across the uh, across Kansas and all, for them to be in the mountains and doing here for turns were going to require so much tunneling and so much bridge building that was so outrageously expensive. It just it never could happen. Um, but a small three foot wide railroad could uh, definitely uh, go over the mountains and go into the canyons into the canyons between them. And so by the end of that year, between the end of 1870, he has incorporated his idea into the uh, Denver and Rio Grande uh, Narrow Gauge Railroad, which he pledges to the people of Colorado he will build without a penny of their money, providing he can get a right of way on either side of his main line going north and south and his spurs that are going to go now into the mines and, and, and all. Um, and so in six years' time, he has trains running from Denver first to Colorado Springs, then Colorado Springs to Plato, Plato to Walsenburg, and finally on, um, in June 1876, a train pulls right up the main street of this town. And uh, at that very same time, Palmer had just per not purchased, he was given uh, 200 acres by uh, Dager and Francisco, on which he has now platted a town and he has given it the name of Levita. Um, so he arrives, the railroad arrives, and Levita arrives at the same at the same time. And uh, a little while later, all of the higher ups arrive in Levita to go on the Fourth of July, see the parades, watch the baseball games, the horse races, and and stuff like that. Um, and one assumes, I assume. 
that uh, with Palmer here, um, Hiram, who felt the 4th of July was almost a religious uh, holiday and never would miss it, he, uh, he probably took Palmer's measure that day as he saw him up on the days talking. And uh, one can assume that Palmer, looking back, would spot this very tall man with such blue eyes. I don't know if any of you remember Claudia Capps. Um, she was a good friend. She, she knew Hiram Baskets. And she said you could identify him a, a, a block away. Wow. Those eyes were just so, so amazing. And uh, so we assume that they liked what they uh, did from that day on. Um, towns like Levita and all of the, well, not Garland City, but most of the towns began to boom, really boom. The uh, uh, population of Colorado went from 10,000 in 1870 to 150,000 six years later because of all of these railroads going everywhere and that made it big enough to qualify to become a state um, which it was made on uh, in uh, the centennial year 1876 and it was granted by none other than his previous commanding officer Ulysses S. Grant who is now the president of the United, United States. Um, the next year 1877 Hiram, I mean, uh, Palmer gets his railroad up over the Vita Pass, the highest pass in the world. He opens up the whole San Luis Valley. He goes on, he opens up the San Juan Mountains. He gets his railroads up to Leadville, the biggest silver uh, camp ever. Um, and he just, he just keeps, uh, keeps building um, his empire. Finally, he sets his sights on, um, on, uh, uh, Utah. He's now going to take his train to Utah and to all of these other places, and he ends up with a railroad empire that looks like that. Um, and uh, he he did it not without uh, some friction. He was forever uh, he, he he faced so many financial crises, but he'd make his way through. He uh, would fight with his board of directors over strategy. They'd fire him, they'd rehire him, they'd fire him, they'd rehire him. Uh, and all, he was always at odds with other railroads that were trying to open up in the same territory, sometimes with guns. Hiram took his issues to the Supreme Court. He won. Um, but uh, he was also always fighting um, the uh, a battle of his wife's failing heart. She so wanted to live in Colorado, couldn't. She ended up living in England, and she died at age 44, when her heart just finally, finally gave out. Um, but throughout all those ups and downs, he liked Hiram Baskets. He just always recouped. He, um, he never lost his faith in Colorado, his love of living. Um, and he, like Hiram, just was just made that, was just made that way. Okay, so the last years, we'll, we'll go kind of fast. Uh, um, Hiram finally stops moving in uh, 1911. I don't know if you all know Kenny Schneider's house. That was, uh, that was the house. Um, and he, uh, Hiram, by that time, had owned five farms and five, um, uh, five houses in, in around here in Aguilar and all. But he got this one and a half story house and uh, that's where he was going to stay. Sadly, that was the same year that he lost his uh, little daughter, Maddie, um, age 16, to typhoid. Uh, and then six months later, lost his handsome, strapping young son, Charles, uh, to a twisted bowel. Um, and, then he, uh, and then he also learned that year that his uh, native father had died. Um, uh, uh, Oshaki had, uh, had died. He was the only, only Indian chief ever to be given the honor of having a fort named after him and being given a full military burial. Um, and uh, his, his loss really, really uh, struck, struck um, Hiram hard. He and Martha would use, sometimes those deaths would draw them together. Most of the time, um, they'd be sitting next to their stove at night, he laughing or crying over a poem or a story that he loved. And Martha would look at them, and uh, slowly a pained expression of resignation would steal across her face as she would realize Hiram was soon going to read out loud to her. <laughs> um, and, um, and, uh, I, and, and as Maude, his daughter, said, 
my poor father over and over would just throw himself against the brick wall of my <laughs> mother's personality, only to come away bruised, almost to the point he couldn't stand it. But Hiram did bear it. He, um, people would never know that his home life was not all that happy uh, because he just remained a permanently positive man and he was still really making an enormous contribution to, to this town. He, um, he, whether he was uh, um, getting, he had so many contracts with the, with the railroad for 40,000 railroad ties at a, at a whack. Um, he was the one who was hired to uh, widen the pass in order to make it uh, accessible for, for, for vehicles. Uh, he and his crew what, what year was that? Um, that was in, I'm going to say, you know, probably in the 20s. Um, that, I mean, the railroad had been torn up in 1999, 1899, and, uh, and cars were already starting to go up and over it. But when they finally really widened, the state widened the highway. Um, and, uh, and then straightened, straightened to the river, that twisty river that was always flooding and causing all kinds of problems. Our oh, river. Our Kachara, river. The Kachara, yeah. the Kachara River. So he straightened? Uh -huh. he, he was one of the ones that um, um, helped, helped do that. Uh, however, he now was uh, letting his work team do this loyal work team who just Worship this this man. They call him their steely-eyed, blue-eyed Ringo boss, um, and who could still lift a, an anvil in one hand. He could work for hours on end, no gloves, no jacket, no hat, in below zero weather. It's from his Shoshone days, he was impervious to cold. Um, but his new joy was to go check up on these guys, whether they were up on the pass or whatever, in his new Ford car. This was his new, new joy. Um, and, uh, but sometimes he would drive it almost like a horse, and he was known to just come straight off of Dump Mountain. No road, just come straight down, you know, because he was late for a pool hall game or something like that, which actually was one of the things that he did in his mid-70s. So at my age, he took up pool going to the pool hall, and he and his, uh, his son, um, Fred, who had lost an eye to a mining accident, uh, so was one of the two of them became the hottest pool players in, uh, in the whole area. I mean, they were just known to be, to be un, un, uh, unbeatable. Um, and the other thing that really, really gave him such sustaining um, uh, support was his Masonic Brotherhood. He uh, was a member for over 50 years. He and Henry Dager and Fred Walson, who did all the camps, and uh, Samuel Capps, they all became great friends. They would all meet. And the, uh, when the lodge was opened in La Vida, they, they switched there. And Hiram was raised to a master, uh, grandmaster at age 84. And there was a lot of debate. Is that too much to put on his shoulders? And they realized nobody, but nobody knew more about the rituals than he did. He knew them absolutely letter perfect. So he accepted that. He enjoyed it for, well, he lived, what, another 12 years. Um, and his other great love was he would sit out on his porch and uh, with a big pipe, and he would just wait for this endless stream of friends to come by, come up on his porch, play a couple games of cribbage, and then, and then go on. Um, that's what he was doing unless Hiram Best was Just back up. You need to... That's a cribbage board. That's the cribbage board. Uh, yes, he, and I'll talk a little bit about, he made this cribbage board when he was a young man. Mm -hmm. He replaced every single piece of it over and over. There wasn't an original piece left on it, but it always looked the same. There is now a hunt on for that board. It was given by his daughter to the author of the book. And her family is not sure where it's gotten mm -hmm. to. But I'm going to tell you, uh, just now while we're on it, um, she put in her book such a perfect description of how he made of, of this board that if anybody has any inclination or knows anybody who might have an inclination to try and replicate it, I've copied the description uh, on, and you can take a hand up back there. It'd be fabulous if somebody would ever look into making making um, another one. But as I said, he, he, the only other thing that just topped his list was a circus. 
they would come, they'd park right over across the tracks. You know, there wasn't a, a road going out there. They'd have a great big old tent. And uh, he would gather up everybody in his family, of course, excepting Martha, and uh, <laughs> get them all to go. And I mean, he, he, he to talk, watch people dive into a little pool, you know, from way up there in the earth. I mean, or to have the strong lady pick up a dinner party, you know, all in her hands. She'd also pull four elephants with her teeth. Um, and uh, but the, the high point for him was always seeing the, the little lady shot out of the can. You know, um, that was that was that was what made life worth living, as far as uh, Hiram was concerned. Hiram, um, he uh, on the day he died in June 1939, he was age 96. He still stood six foot two inches tall. Uh, he walked every day to the post office in this um, Indian shuffle, they called it. He would walk and he'd place one foot directly in front of the other really fast. He'd just move, 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 but always, always walking in that same way. He got home, uh, and as was his way, he chopped a little wood, he fed the chickens, he, you know, gathered eggs, and then finally he sat on his porch waiting for a pre-lunch cribbage game to show up, which it invariably did. After lunch, he went in, he lay down, and he would read uh, either his Bible or history. Those were his, his loves. Meanwhile, his daughter Maud and Martha were in the kitchen, busying themselves. They checked, and when they called him to dinner, he was gone. And so he just died at home reading on, on just a perfect kind of Levita, Levita day. Mm -hmm. um, and he was soon, uh, soon after there, buried up at the um, cemetery um, here, looking out over his uh, loved uh, Spanish peaks, surrounded by his children. And then nine months later, Martha uh, died too and took up her space that she occupied for 63 years. Right next to Hiram, you know, happily or not, <laughs> we we'll just have to, we we'll just have to wait. How far okay. apart were they buried? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, I want to get that name of the the um, the cemetery named. I mean, Dagger and Vasquez and Francisco. I mean, all the founders are are there and. Uh, um, but anyway, so Palmer um, said uh, he retired in 1901. Uh, he retired from railroading. He had made three million dollars in profit on selling his railroad, and he had very strongly developed ideas of what he wanted to do with that money. The first one was that he um, he wanted to uh, take one third of that money and give it to the people who physically helped make his railroad a success. Everybody else would be getting stock and that kind of thing, but he wanted to um, get a hold of the firemen, the brakemen, the baggage handlers, the wheel greasers, and to fulfill that dream, he would ride around the state in his own private car called the uh, Nomad, and uh, to personally hand out these hand out these checks. He'd hand them out and then he'd scrape it because he never wanted to be thanked. He he was very a very modest, uh, shy man in, in many respects, but. Uh, it was, um, it was believed, this is just a little side story, it was believed by some skeptics after a while that this whole thing was just a myth, this, this thing about a story. And so there was a journalist from Denver who was in the Springs, he overheard a man talking about the palm gifts, and so he challenged him and he said, you know, what, what's your proof that these are things, any, anything other than a fairy tale? And the man said, well, sir, I can tell you it's true because I was a DNRG uh, engineer and I personally received $25,000 personally from Palmer, and then I watched him give $5,000 to a baggage handler right next to me. Oh. He said, I know it was true because I was there in and out. So uh, Palmer's second thing was at the end of the Civil War, his biggest commitment was he thought, he thought the most strategic and important thing America could do would be to make sure every single slave was given an education. Mm -hmm. And of course that would have happened with Lincoln, it had Lincoln not died. But now he was going to take um, uh, a third of his money and he was put, going to put it into uh, schooling. Uh, this is Hampton <coughs> Institute, overlooks where that big naval battle happened. Uh, still is a college today. I just heard one of their graduates interviewed on uh, NPR. Huh? Virginia. Virginia. Uh, Virginia. Um, and uh, he, um, so that's what he believed that the slaves and their children just had to have. And so 
Um, what he did was he took one of his most trusted uh, uh, associates, Paul, uh, Peabody, and gave him a, a stock. And he said, I want you to use this in any way you think best for Hampton, Hampton College. Um, and so uh, ultimately, uh, one of the many, many things they did was to build Palmer, um, Palmer Hall. And at the dedication of it, um, uh, Peabody was speaking and he quoted saying, um, uh, Palmer powerfully believed, quote, in all men's right to freedom in developing their own powers. That's what he wanted to have happen. He also said uh, that all of Palmer's experience confirmed his belief in the Negro's capacity for high service and that Palmer hoped through his philanthropy he could help raise the race to the fullness of its human rights and to help right our nation's dreadful wrong. That's what motivated him with his philanthropy throughout his life. Um, the last thing that he got into was he wanted to, Colorado Springs he just thought as seeing could be really a little heaven on earth. Um, he wanted to see it to be a place of schools, colleges, literature, science, and newspapers. He just so valued uh, the worth of a good newspaper. So over his life, I mean, during his retirement, um, and all over his life in particular, he gave over 1,600 acres to Colorado Springs for parks. He gave over 85 miles for boulevards and trails. Uh, he um, gave 10 acres and all of the funds to build the Colorado School for the Deaf and Blind. He uh, was a constant benefactor of uh, Colorado College. This is um, uh, Palmer Hall of Science. And uh, anyway, that's Colorado College was really one of the dearest things to this art. And then on the latter side of things, he wanted to make sure that the best talent in all of America was coming to his town, whether they were opera singers or speakers or whatever. And so he built the Antlers Hotel. Uh, actually, he built it twice. It burned to the ground, and he built it back, uh, back up. Um, so once his philanthropic uh, needs were taken care of, he sat back to uh, enjoy his life. Uh, one of his first focuses was on fulfilling a promise he made to his bride in, on their honeymoon, that one day they would have a home that uh, looked like Dunkeld House in Scotland. That was where they had honeymooned, and that's what he had promised he would build her someday, um, which then became this house, and then became that house, Glen Erie. Um, so he he fulfilled he fulfilled that. He had time to take way more time with his three daughters, uh, who he thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed. He was an avid reader of poetry. He would memorize all these poems. He just memorized, memorized, memorized. Uh, but he also um, converse with like Louis with scientists all over the world, and like he and Louis worked on uh, how to pasteurize the cream from his Holstein um, cows. He was a man just of avid avid interest in uh, in any any way that he could. But above all else, he was a writer that was probably the greatest pleasure. He would take a five mile ride every single day through the Garden of the Guards, uh, usually accompanied by a Great Dane. And I want to tell you about the Great Dane. <coughs> Uh, just, oh, I mean, look at that. That's a great name. Uh, and um, uh, and uh, but then one day in October 1906, he was on his uh, trusty old steed. He was still pretty feisty, schoolboy. The horse stumbled. Palmer was thrown over his head, and he landed with such force. Uh, that his spinal cord was destroyed from his neck down and he became a paraplegic. Oh my god. Yep. Um, and uh, for the next several months, uh, the doctors tried to assess the damage, they tried to control his excruciating pain, uh, they tried to figure out what therapies he needed, during which his mood just went between disbelief and despair. Uh, and then one day, he said, that's it. I'm not doing this anymore. And uh, he wasn't going to let his paralysis or his pain define him. And so he ordered a specially customized car that had this big bowl rubber seat made in the back of it to absorb all of the jarring that he would do. And he just took off to the hills. And I mean, literally, he would just go on these wild rides all over everywhere that he could, believing in the power of fresh air to, to, uh, to make one happy. He had this car first. 
and then he had a family steamer, which he really, really loved. Um, and, uh, and it gave him not only a sense of control, but it gave him a, a belief that he could help. And just one little story, the first, almost the first day he was in the stand of steamer, he was driving it, this woman came running out of the street, screaming that she just started a fire in her house and needed help. And he said, you just stay right there. He went and got the fire department, came back for the next 10 days. He visited her every day to make sure she was OK. He would bring her these little gifts, these little books to distract her. And for the rest of his life, he would send her plants from his, um, his greenhouse to put in her, her oh. garden. It gave him a reason to be, to be uh, back. Um, and probably his uh, biggest grand gesture of reconcerting control was his uh, regiment had a, a reunion right, right after his accident. He wasn't able to go to Philadelphia. And so he held a second reunion at Glen Airy. And uh, fully paid door to door, 278 uh, men from his regiment were able to make it. They came for nine days. They had fireworks. They had parades. They had, I mean, uh, black tie that are here, um, you can see. And uh, one of the last things they did was went on all these excursions, including going to the top of Pikes Peak and the, the Cobb Cob Railroad. Mm -hmm. Everybody leaving saying they had never had a more unbelievably fantastic time uh, than that. A short while later, his, uh, oh, well, these are, his daughter, his youngest daughter, said she was going to be marrying an Englishman in England. And he said, well, then we're going. And so they got on the Canard Line across the ocean. Halfway there, his daughter said the uh, wedding was off. She'd fallen in love with his doctor. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but for six months, they continued still traveling all around Europe. And what the family later learned was one of his motives was to talk with a specialist in paralysis in France. And mm -hmm. he obviously did meet with him. He didn't get any good news. He came home somewhat deflated. Uh, but uh, it was Christmas time. They had all these Christmas traditions that uh, his wife had started, and he um, he kept up. And he had still insisted on his daily drive uh, in his car, even on the day when it was uh, at a 35-year all-time low. He went out, came home, said, "I feel fantastic. I love life." He went to bed and he died. Yay. And. Uh, so he, um, he was very, all of Colorado Springs participated in his mourning. Um, but uh, you can see his gravestone showed what, a, what place that his regiment held in his, in his heart. Um, these are the only things that are on the Medal of Honor, Brigadier General, 15th Pennsylvania Cavalry, Civil War, and his, and his dates. Um, so he never, he never was a strong Quaker, but those that upbringing always was present in in uh, in his in his life. So and Glen Erie, you can visit today. Well, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so anyway, I'm again. I'm hoping that we now all can become more familiar with this incredible cast of characters who uh, really um, made La Vida thrive, and hopefully their spirit will uh, keep us running for a good long time. Uh, there's no question that um, Francisco was the first, Dagger was the newer, Hiram was the heart, and uh, and Palmer was the visionary. Um, that's uh, and without that whole whole mix, I don't think we would have the, the town that we have today. So. Uh, no. Glen Airy. Mm -hmm. um, I, I cannot uh, recommend it more. Um, well, what do we think? We think, that, we think the room staying in his room is like a hundred bucks a night. We never got in his, but we got in hers. Hers, her, yes. Her, her, her bucks. Yeah, yeah. And uh, um, anyway, it's a it's <coughs> fabulous. In that yeah, it's a round thing. It's a it's a fabulous uh, time. If if you go to tea there. 
you will get to see. So one of the many stories you can't tell about this family is um, his, uh, oh, you can also visit, the, I mean, this is one of the most wonderful statues, and of course it's how he would want to be remembered as quite an equestrian sitting around. Because he was down 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 this, uh, <coughs> That's on uh, um, Platt yeah. Avenue. In uh, in Colorado Springs, he was never able to sit up again after his after his accident. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, um, if you go to Glacier, this is a painting by singer Sargent of his daughter. It caused an international stir. No one knew what to make of it. I mean, if you ever go, if you ever go to um, go to Glenary, uh, I recommend Sargent's Women. The story about this part portrait <laughs> is just. Uh, an interesting, an interesting book. Um, but the uh, uh, other thing that, again, I wanted to ask, how many of you are cribbage players? <coughs> how many of you are wannabe cribbage players? <laughs> oh, there's the other hand. You've got to put the hand up. Um, anyway, I, I have plans to do a few cribbage things in this town. And if you are in any way at all inclined, downstairs there's a cribbage sign-up sheet, which will only be used for cribbage-related things. But if you want to be notified of any cribbage things that um, are about to, to happen, uh, please do that. And again, if you know anybody who feels like making a very, very elaborate uh, cribbage, cribbage board, I would ask that you, uh, that you take that. So, um, Thank you all for coming, you. and um, I'm happy if there, I think we've covered everything, but um, questions? if you have any, 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 other, any other questions uh, about either of these two men. Yes. You know, I think it's interesting that Palmer named, was the one who named La Vida, La Vida, and with it being the vein, I see what he was doing to pull lifeblood to these little communities. Maybe that's where the vein comes from. Yeah, I like. I like, I like that. Yeah, I like, I like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, I like that. Um, and uh, yeah. So he was the one who put the town here. And yeah, the fact that he named it. <coughs> when I see what happens with the tributaries. Uh huh. Yeah. I'm going to have to go, but this was absolutely wonderful, and I applaud your years of research. That went into <laughs> Thank you. So I, I did get out of my chair. <laughs> Yeah. Oh. It's on film for the library.